Hello and welcome to the Team Predictor here on the Arsenal Way as we get ready to predict the 11 we want to see Mikel Arteta pick for the Gunners next outing. And of course, it's a trip to St. Mary's to take on the Saints as Arsenal look to pick up their faltering bid for a top four finish. Myself, Guy Clark and Umar Chowdhury are here to talk through the Arsenal's options for the visit to Southampton. And uh, what Umar called it faltering there, the, the bid for a top four finish. Arsenal still very much in the thick of it, but the momentum that seems to be built up pre-international break has evaporated quite quickly. It has. It's crazy to think about that it's still in our hands. Realistically, it's yeah, more. Yeah. But if we win all our games, which is yeah, more than unlikely, we'll get into the top four. But in terms of momentum, the momentum's on the other side of North London at the moment. They're firing on all cylinders. They're scoring so many goals. And with Arsenal at the moment, we're faltering. Injury problems. Can't find the back of the net in recent games. And it's just same old, same old. You think about when Unai Emery's top four bid faltered. It was against Brighton and Palace. And it's deja vu for Mikel Arteta. So, but he needs to turn it around against Southampton. He needs to get a bit of momentum to at least give some time to something to think about. That's the most important thing. Don't let the top four bid just go away so quickly. At least give Tottenham something to think about in the next few weeks. And that has to start on the weekend. Anything other than a win, and I think it's game over for sure because then we play Chelsea and then we play Manchester United. So we have to get up and running, and it's against the Southampton team who conceded six in the previous game. So you know what's going to happen. Southampton 2, Arsenal 1. Yeah, they've, <laughs> we'll get two predictions in a bit. But, but yeah, they've conceded 10 goals in the last two home games. Uh, Man City in the FA Cup, 4-1 defeat. And the 6-0 against Chelsea as well. This is actually a game for a little while I've, I've kind of been looking at and, and dreading a bit. I know our record at St Mary's actually isn't all too bad. But I have to say, it always seems to me to, to be one of those games that comes around and tests the metal of the players and don't really have the answers. What was it, 2014 was it with Chesney? drinking out the bottle in, in the back of his goal. The Cuco Martina one in, in 2015. Last year, of course, the FA Cup, albeit I know there was the, the, the back-to-back games and it was the league one that was prioritised and, and got a result in that one. But Ralph ha- hassan Huttle's side can be very streaky, can't they? And you, it, I, I suppose it's all about the, the point of the season at which you get them. And off the back of a 6-0 win, I'm sure they're going to want to... Uh, 6-0 defeat, sorry. They're going to want to uh, put things right and, and hit back with a win. It's, it's it's crazy to think about Ralph Hassan who all oh, he's he's done a very good job for Southampton, but when it comes to the end of the season, Southampton always falter because they don't have they're in the position where they're safe and they're in the position where they're not going to be challenging for the European spots. So they're just in the middle. So they're just thinking about the summer holidays, most of the players, even the managers probably thinking about the summer holidays. So hopefully it's the best time to get them because you'd like to think they'll be short on confidence, but it's Arsenal. So you never know what Arsenal side will turn up as well. But like I said, we have to go there and we have to be on the front foot. And yeah, we'll talk about the lineups now because it's, it's going to be make for interesting reading. Yeah, going back to what we were saying at the at the top about kind of top four chances and how it's it's kind of swung around and, and changed pre-international break. I didn't see a way in which Arsenal probably weren't going to do it, but injuries have struck. And as you say, we best get into the teams because all of a sudden, after a few weeks of, of doing these where I was basically just making Cedric the, uh, the full guy and finding whatever way I could to get him out of the team, all of a sudden we do have options, but not really because we want to, but more through... Through, uh, well, necessity that there aren't the, the likes of Tierney and, and Thomas Partey available. And Tierney and Partey, they're such pivotal players, especially for this system. So when you take those two out of this team, the whole dimension, the whole shape of this team changes. It shouldn't, especially when you have Nuno Tavares, who is a left back, but he's short of confidence. He's underperforming. Mikate doesn't trust him at the moment. So then you have to change the formation in the midfield. Shaka has to revert to a left-back position. And then the midfield is weak. And it was like against Brighton. Shaka went into left-back. And then you had Odegaard and Saka, who are forming such a great partnership on their right-hand side. 
and they didn't have that last weekend against Brighton. And then you have Smith Rowe, who you had to change from on the left wing position and then to go into the midfield, and he didn't look good. And Brighton's midfield overpowered us. They were too far, they were too strong on the day. And as soon as we like reverted back to our normal position and Shaka went back into midfield, we looked a bit more better, m- more composed, and we had more of the ball. But that's why this this weekend, I think you have to play Tavares because he should have played against Brighton. I know he's not having the best of times at the moment. He's short on confidence, but Brighton was the perfect game. Can you see him on that? Can you see I mean, this is obviously the sides we want to see picked rather than specifically what we think will get picked. I mean, I've I've been quite vocal on Nuno Tavares since the the Palace game. I'd be amazed if we see him for the rest of the season. But especially given what happened at Forest away from home, what happened at Selhurst Park away from home, I agree with you. If he was going to play, it had to be against Brighton in a home game, try and build him some confidence. Can you see him coming in in an away game like this? He has to because you'd rather him play. And he... right now we don't have the options. That's that's the fact. He's a left back. He knows the position. Yeah, he may have limitations to his game. He may underperform at times. But I'd rather him play left back rather than Shaka go into left back because then the whole structure of the team changes, and then we don't have a chance at all in the game. I think. He may may make may make a mistake on Saturday, but then you at least trust the forward attacking players, Odegaard, Saka, Martinelli, Smith Rowe, to get us out of that mess because they can score at any given moment. But if you decide to play Shaka at left back and start playing Lokonga, Odegaard, Smith Rowe, the midfield is just gonna get overrun, it's gonna get overpowered. So I think Mikko Arteta, give him faith, maybe assess the situation in the summer after the season has ended. If you don't think he's the right man going forward, let him go, sell him. But for right now, we don't have Kieran Tierney. There's been talks of Luis Souza. He's been in training, but he's still young. Tavares is a far more experienced left back than him. So you have a left back there, play him. So I think he has to start. Yeah, okay. So you've got Ramsdale and goal back for Cedric White, Gabriel and Tavares. Midfield three, then you've got Lokonga, Erdegaard. And Xhaka, do you want Lukonga at the base there or Xhaka there? Or I mean, how important is Granite Xhaka into that midfield, as you say? Because Smith Rowe, Erdegaard and Lukonga is a very youthful midfield. None of those over the age of, of what, 24, 23? Um, Xhaka adds some experience and now some, some Premier League know-how, I suppose, in that midfield. Xhaka's been playing in the Premier League for so many years, to be honest. And as a midfielder, I think he's a very good midfielder and he dictates the play. He's very good with the ball and he's forward thinking as well. He always looks for a pass forwards. He doesn't look sideways and he doesn't go back more often at the time. So I think in midfield right now with party's injury, this is the best setup that we can have. Shaka, Odegaard and Lokonga. Maybe Shaka and Lokonga in a pivot and Odegaard in front in a number 10 position. But it's up for McArthur to decide that because Southampton, like I said, they're going to be short of confidence and we have to take the game to them. Yet the fans will be pumped and Southampton's a very good pressing team as well. So they're going to be on the front foot. So they're going to be challenging our defenders to quickly make mistakes. But right now, Lukonga as well, first half of all against Brighton, he didn't have the best of games, but that's understandable. He was playing with Smith throw. And he was playing with Odegaard. It was, like you said, a youthful midfield. And Lokonga is just coming into the team as well after not being in the team for many matches. So when Shaka came on, when Shaka came aside, next to him, I think Lokonga played much better in the second half. He was more forward thinking and he was doing what we know what he's capable of doing. So I think for me, it depends what Mikata decides to go with. But I think those three... It's a certainty, especially with the injuries that we have. Yeah, definitely. And then your forward line, Saka and Smith row wide. Martinelli's getting the call through the middle. He has to. He has to. I think the times um, come for Martinelli to be given a chance up front. I think a lot of people have been calling for it. Ian Wright has been calling for it. Many people have been calling for it. Like I said, Lacazette, 
he's underperformed and that's fair enough it can happen but what will fans will be critical more of is Mikhail Tet needs to take him off the firing line for how many matches it doesn't even look like Lacazette's going to score it doesn't even look like he's going to have a shot on target He's, what, are, we at, are we at 18 yeah. games in open he's, play? Yeah, yeah. It was against Southampton. Southampton it was corresponding yeah. So he's he's not athletic enough, I think. His athleticism is poor. He doesn't have the pace to run in behind defences. And he comes too deep for my liking as a striker. As a striker, you should be near the penalty area and he should be linking up there. But more time, more often than not, he's on the halfway line and he doesn't have the pace. Look at Saka, Smith, or Martinelli. Look how energetic, look how pacey they are. And when they travel with the ball, Lacazette can't keep up with them. And then when they're firing balls into the box, no one's in the box to finish it off because Lacazette can't get there. So I think right now, that performance against Brighton as well, he was very, very poor. He was underwhelming. So now I think if the time's come, you can't, we have eight matches or so left of the season. We're not the favourites to get top four. And with Lacazette starting, we won't get top four. We won't even be in for a shout. So if I'd rather see Martinelli be given a chance in these next eight games, let's see what he can do in the number nine position. Maybe he can give Arteta forward thinking more problems next season. But we won't know that if he keeps persisting with Alexandre Lacazette, especially when he's out of contract this summer as well. So I think you need to start thinking about the future and you need to start thinking about players who can cause problems on the break. So, yeah, Martinelli has to start without a shadow of a doubt. Right, OK, that, that taken on board. Oh, no, I've got Lacazette right at the top of the pitch. <laughs> yeah, Look at, looking at my team then, I've I've gone for, for some differences to, to yourself. Um, Ramsdale and goal obviously goes without saying. Back four for me, I've got White at right back again. This is as close to, I think, the team I wanted to see last weekend against Brighton. Um, maybe as, as uh, for me, this is the strongest Arsenal team right now. Is White at right back, Cedric push him over to the left. I just can't see Nuno Tavares coming back in. Um, I, I just uh, and especially the, the the managing of the situation. It's, it's mm. definitely where Mikel Arteta needs to improve. But coming out after the game against Crystal Palace and protecting the player was definitely the right thing to do. Saying it was a tactical decision to take Nuno Tavares off for that game, but then to not pick him for the following match. Actions speak louder than words. And to me, that was then kind of nailing his colours to the mast of, of not having the trust in Nuno Tavares. And, and therefore, as I say, Cedric goes over to the left-hand side for me, holding as a experienced, reliable player. Yes, this season, by and large, when he's come in, he's, he's played in the back three, but I, I think needs must. White obviously played at right back for England uh, during the last international break. For me, player for player in, in each position, that is how Arsenal looks strongest until Tommy Asu comes back. Then you put White back in alongside Gabriel. Um, that, that That's kind of my reading of the situation. It, we've, we've obviously spoken a lot in recent weeks about how Arsenal didn't sign a striker in the January window and how costly that was. How costly was the decision to maybe let Callum Chambers walk away with six months left on his contract, given he was going to go on a free already? Um, he could have he could have filled in at right back here, and, and Cedric could have gone across to the left. And you keep White and Gabriel. I mean, again, it was a, it, it was a huge gamble that was taken in January. It ultimately, looks like it will backfire, but that doesn't mean that the the complete thinking of it all was wrong for, from from my perspective. But you do wonder with a few of them how short and how small a squad we left ourselves with was always going to be liable to to something going wrong. You have Ainsley Maitland-Niles, who's faltering in Roma. He's, he's set to come back in the summer, so he was another one. But I was contemplating, to be honest, I was contemplating playing holding at centre-back. But then I thought Southampton, a very good pressing team, they're always going to be on the front foot. They're always going to be pressurising our defenders. And holding who's not played for for quite a while. How will, he, how will he fare with that? Because he's not the best when it comes to playing out of the back and why is more comfortable but i can see why you're going with that because injuries at the moment they're costing arsenal so you have to make do with what you have and if that's why go over to right back to get holding into center back it's something that mikata needs to think about 
but um it's it's just right now the injuries it's 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 sad to be honest to see because we had the momentum the top four race was in our hands and as always at the right moment at the wrong moment the injury strike party he was flying he was having so many good games week in week out and it was the best thomas party we've seen since he joined from atletico madrid and then tierney he went on to our international duty with scotland he picked up a knock there he came back and he said he wasn't feeling too great with his knee and they assessed it and he's out for the rest of the season so i think to be honest I, when you compare arsenal's defense to tottenham they have christian romero who i think has had a good season this season he's come on his own but i think the most important aspect between both teams is the firepower up front harry kane human song and dejan kluveski they have so much firepower and it's a great front three so when you compare arsenal's saka yes he's a great player smith throw yes martinelli yes but the number nine he doesn't get i mean that's it that said no i completely agree that said though tottenham's number nine at the moment well i mean he wears the 10 doesn't he harry kane but yeah he's not particularly firing but he's just getting yeah, all the assists and exactly. getting around the pitch isn't he and for me that's why we, we both got the same midfield erdegaard yeah. lakonga and jacker i've got saka smith row right and left respectively and lacazette through the middle like i said before going away to crystal palace i think a lot of it's about control uh, especially as you say how, how how pressing that southampton are um, I don't think we want to get into an end-to-end -end encounter with them, certainly with this team that I've picked, and therefore I think Smith Rowe offers that touch more balance to the side. Um, but that said, I'm looking at it and I'm actually thinking if Lacazette is injured, obviously there's reports of him in not being involved in training and not going to be available for the game. My preference in that regard would be keep Martinelli on the left and I put Smith Rowe through the middle as a player who can link the play and hopefully get on the half turn and start linking going forward in that regard. I mean, it would effectively, wouldn't even be playing a false nine. It would be playing without a striker because I don't think Smith Rowe's got that, that instinct, albeit we've said with Lacazette on the stream already that his instinct in that regard has gone too. Um, but that'd be my thinking is keep the, keep the wide threats alive with, with Martinelli and, and Saka and let Smith Rowe. Mikel Arteta said it after the was it the the game with Brentford? I think it was. Yeah. He sort of said he can play in a number of positions. He can play in that that left hand side number eight role. He can play as a false nine. Uh, but of course, we saw it away at Villarreal last year. I don't think really that was a fair reflection of what he can do there, or mm. probably the right time to try it. But it might be now, um, and we might be forced into it. I mean, for me, if Lacazette's fit, he's got to play because he's the only striker we have about. It's, but that's uh, that's a player getting into a position yeah. purely because there's there, there isn't an option. He's not because yeah, I know, he's I know. the best man for the job. It's because he's the only man. Would you would would you wouldn't you think Enketia? I, I, I toyed with it for a bit, but I just don't think he's back to goal. I don't think. And see, that's the that, that's the thing. I think yeah. Smith Rowe can link the play, and that's why I'd I'd have I, I'd, I'd give him a go up there, and let's just see what happens. Um, because I think Lacazette, I think he's, he's built up with that. Other than when he comes too deep to get involved, which he was definitely doing at, at Selhurst Park against Palace, and the ball was bouncing off him, and it was actually giving them a lot more attacking opportunities. But prior to prior to the break, I mean, at, at, at Villa Park, he was brilliant in what he did, um, and has been, and that's why early part of the season, I really enjoyed seeing him in that number ten role because he was able to still come deep, but there was someone beyond him who, as you said before, could stretch the back line. Um, but we'll have to wait and see how it is. I mean, with Lacazette, obviously, we know he, he, he runs empty after about 70 minutes. Mm. But that week in, week out starting, he's not been a week in, week out starter yeah. for Arsenal for over two years. And I think now it's beginning to catch up with him a bit. And that's been in a period of the season where we've had a week between games. I mean, after this, of course, as you say, we're then looking at a midweek game, then another game. And we'll, we'll have more games coming up. And all of a sudden, the rest and recovery times aren't quite as... As what they were early part of the season but 
that's kind of how our, our two teams are looking. I mean, let us know your thoughts in the comment section. We will keep an eye on them. We are recording uh, well in advance of Mikel Arteta's press conference and knowing the full up-to-date injury news for the Arsenal. It could or might yet be worse. We'll have to wait and see. But your prediction for the, for the outcome at St Mary's? It's going to be a tough game because I think Southampton, they want a reaction. They'll be expecting a reaction. and But we have to win. The, the tide has to turn at some point. We can't just let this season go to waste because we have had a decent season and we've been challenging at the top end of the table. So I'm going to go a bit optimistic, but I'm going to go 2-1 to Arsenal. 2-1. And that yet shouldn't feel too optimistic. But yeah. as you say, I think for me, for me, it's, it's, it's a one-all draw at Southampton, I think. Um, I think that was what I said on the stream that Tom, myself and, and Bailey did a few weeks back or last week, as it was, uh, looking at this run of fixtures. Uh, the Brighton game, I think, as you said right at the top, Unai Emery vibes off those those defeats at, at Palace and Brighton. Um, which actually is even worse than, than how it went under Unai Emery. But it is what it is. We'll have to wait and see how it does, in fact, play out. Make sure to keep across the Arsenal way, football.london as well, with plenty of build-up and reaction to the game. And remember to come back here and check out Mikel Arteta's full post-match press conference after the game. But from myself, Guy Clark and Uma Chowdhury, thanks for joining us. And remember, keep following us down the Arsenal way. Glory, 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 glory